thank you for taking the time this afternoon to join us for this what should be a very interesting seminar on the complicated and really interesting topic of indigenous data sovereignty and indigenous data governance um, before we start i'd just like to acknowledge that we all are living and working on aboriginal land my name is brendan thomas i'm a deputy secretary here at the new south wales department of communities and justice so welcome and I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you this afternoon from the land of the Baramadigal people here in Western Sydney. And I'd like to pay my respects to the Baramadigal people, to the wonderful history and culture that comes with Baramadigal country here in Western Sydney that stems through thousands of years with the song lines along the river here in Parramatta and pay my respects to the Darug Nation and the people of Sydney. And also pay my respects to all the elders and the countries that all of you are joining us from this afternoon. So hello to all my Aboriginal brothers and sisters that are joining us for this seminar this afternoon and just welcome everybody who's taken the time to listen to us here. Um, in this Faxia Lunch and Learn webinar, Ian Brown and Melona Stevens from the Naramala team are going to talk about how the Department of Communities and Justice has explored the principles of Indigenous data sovereignty and Indigenous data governance, and particularly with their application in the context of government through the Naramanala program, a really important and exciting kind of area of work. So after the presentation this afternoon, hopefully we'll have some time for some questions. So if you've got questions that you'd like to ask um, our presenters or ask about the topic of Indigenous data sovereignty or data governance generally, please put them in the chat and hopefully we'll have a good chance of, of getting to those questions this afternoon. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ian and Melona. Ian Brown is a proud Gumarai man. Melona Stevens is a very proud Yuan woman. Their current roles are Senior Program Officer and Program Officer respectively in the Evidence Bank Implementation Program in Faxia. They're both also part of the Naramanala Aboriginal Knowledge Program team. So I'll hand over to Ian and Melona to take us through the presentation. Over to you guys. Thank you, Brendan. Um, so as Brendan um, uh, alluded to uh, in his introduction to this Faxia Lunch and Learn, um, my name's Ian Brown. I'm a proud Gomorrah man from Maury, New South Wales, and I am a senior program officer within the Narramundala Aboriginal Knowledge Program. Um, Today's presentation will be about how us, uh, myself, Maylona and our project team are building the readiness of government to be able to respond to the principles of Indigenous data governance, which is um, we have to actually create, uh, speak to the distinct difference of what we're trying to do here within DCJ is that we cannot actually enact the principles of Indigenous data sovereignty and Indigenous data governance through government. We actually have an obligation to respond um, to to the principles of Indigenous data sovereignty and governance. <coughs> Apologies. Um, I'd like to start out by, of course, acknowledging country. Naramala acknowledges that Aboriginal people are the First Nation people of New South Wales and pay our respects to elders past, present and those of the future. We acknowledge the ongoing connection that Aboriginal people have to this land and recognise Aboriginal people as the original custodians of this land. I would also like to acknowledge the Awabakal and Waramai people whose traditional homelands I'm coming to you to, from today and pay my respect to them as they maintain custodianship um, to this day over the lands, waters and seaways which surround beautiful Newcastle. I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Melona, as well. Thanks, Ian. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge country. So I'm coming from um, the traditional, my traditional homelands, um, which is on the beautiful south coast here. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the Wadi Wadi, Wandandian, um, Kalangadi, and Jurindra tribes of the Yuan Nation here, um, and pay my respects to elders past, present, um, and extend that respect to any of um, anyone on the call today as well. Uh, Ian, do you want to run us through what we're going? Yep to speak about today? So today we'll be um, speaking through uh, little bits and pieces about what we have done and the journey uh, which has, we have taken to get to the point which we are today in relation to our responsiveness to the principles of Indigenous data sovereignty. So today we're going to be speaking a little bit about Naramanala in terms of who we are, how did we form, 
and what are our aims. We're also going to speak a little bit about the principles of Indigenous data sovereignty and governance to create that context around this presentation and elements as to why IDS and IDG are so important, the foundations of IDS and IDG within DCJ and how we are practically applying the principles within the Department of Communities and Justice. Thanks, Ian. So I'll talk a little bit about Naramanala and who we are. So Naramanala, the Aboriginal Knowledge Program, is a shared journey of discovery, um, which began in 2019. It's a collaborative project between Transforming Aboriginal Outcomes, or TEO, and FAXIA, and uses the knowledge, expertise, and strengths of both units. Uh, so Naramanala is supporting, sorry, and Naramanala is supporting and preparing DCJ to enable, embed and respond to IDS and IDG as is defined and determined by Aboriginal people and communities across New South Wales. Uh, we have an internal Aboriginal data governance group who advocates for and advises on the application of IDS and IDG principles across DCJ's programs, policies, strategies and projects. Uh, so our intent is to promote an ongoing and informed dialogue between government and Aboriginal communities in New South Wales. Um, this ensures the sustainability and longevity of external community IDS and IDG and DCJ's capacity to enable and respond to these structures. So as Ian had mentioned before, we're not um, doing IDS and IDG, but we're preparing DCJ to be able to enable and respond to community IDS and IDG structures once they're established. Uh, so our data governance group, the Naramunala Steering Committee, we have a membership base of 19 staff, 14 of whom are Aboriginal. Our Aboriginal members are staff from various policy and program areas across TEO, FAXIA, our people and cross cluster areas. Um, this offers a range of subject matter expertise, as well as their lived experience, cultural knowledge and community insights that they bring. Uh, while our non-Aboriginal members are staff from FAXIA and Cross Cluster, and they offer value through their research and analytical expertise, as well as their allyship. Uh, so Naramanala's chair is the executive director of FAXIA, Jessica Stewart, and we're championed by and accountable to our executive sponsor, who's the deputy secretary, uh, secretary of Transforming Aboriginal Outcomes, Brendan Thomas. So a bit of a timeline for Naramanala and how we formed. Uh, so in March 2019, um, some of our founding members, staff from TEO, went to an Australian and New Zealand School of Government, an ANSOG presentation about the politics of data and Indigenous data sovereignty. Uh, at the same time, staff from FAXIA were investigating a project to develop a culturally safe research and ethics framework, which was designed for research involving Aboriginal children and families. Um, in April 2019, Teo and Faxia established a working group uh, that investigated the concepts of IDS. We wanted to work in a way that demonstrated courage, collaboration and respect and called ourselves the Aboriginal Knowledge, Knowledge Program. Our first step was to listen and learn from IDS experts. So in June 2019, the Aboriginal Knowledge Program held a workshop where Associate Professor Ray Lovett and Professor Gawain Bodkin Andrews presented on IDS and IDG. Uh, using the knowledge learnt from the workshop, the Aboriginal Knowledge Program then identified five projects to undertake as the first phase of our program. By October 2019, members from the steering committee met with Professor Jackie Troy, an Aboriginal linguist from Sydney University who assisted in giving the program the name Naramanala, uh, which means in the Gadigal language, let's see, hear, think and gather Indigenous knowledge. Uh, so as mentioned, as a result of the learnings and feedback we received from that workshop, um, we formulated our aims for Naramanala. Uh, so our aims are to understand the concepts of Indigenous data sovereignty and governance, to recognise the historical and sometimes current misuse of data about Aboriginal people, and to understand the historical, political, social and cultural context of data, to identify ways the principles of IDS and IDG can have impact upon existing DCJ pro programs and policies to best enable IDS and IDG into the future, to collaborate across DCJ to improve how evidence and data that is about and that impacts upon Aboriginal people is collected, used and governed in DCJ, and to develop frameworks, tools and research to help DCJ see the strengths, challenges and resilience of Aboriginal people. 
So I'll be speaking for a little bit about what Indigenous data sovereignty and Indigenous data governance is uh, within the context that we apply it um, within DCJ. Narrow model uh, subscribes to the definition and principles of Indigenous data sovereignty and governance developed by the Mayam Nara Wingara Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Data Sovereignty Collective, which were adopted by the group in 2019. <coughs> when I'm referring to Indigenous data, Indigenous data is information or knowledge in any format or medium which is about and may affect Indigenous people both collectively and individually. Indigenous data sovereignty is the right of Indigenous people to exercise ownership over Indigenous data. Ownership over, uh, sorry, ownership of data can be expressed through the creation, collection, access, analysis, interpretation, management, dissemination and reuse of Indigenous data. Indigenous data governance is the right of Indigenous people to, autonom to autonomously decide what, how and why Indigenous data are collected, accessed and used. It ensures that data on and or about Indigenous peoples reflects their priorities, values, cultures, worldviews and diversity. So when we're talking about the principles of Indigenous data governance, uh, sorry, Indigenous data sovereignty, Australian Indigenous people have the right to exercise control over the data ecosystem, including creation, development, stewardship, analysis, dissemination and infrastructure development. Data, they also have a right to data that is contextual and disaggregated, which means available and accessible at the individual, community and First Nations level. Data, they also have the right to data that is relevant and empowers sustainable self-determination and effective self-governance. We have a right to data structures that are accountable to Indigenous people and First Nations, and data that is protective and respects our individual and collective interests. So a little bit of a historical context as to why IDS and IDG are so important and relevant within this day and age. We know that there has been a power imbalance between Aboriginal people and Australian government um, has existed since invasion. Aboriginal data has been governed by non-Aboriginal people and institutions since invasion. The people governing the data have power over what data we capture, how that data is interpreted, and then the story that is told. Non-Aboriginal people have misused Aboriginal data, misrepresenting and, uh, misrepresenting and causing harm to Aboriginal people. Aboriginal data has been misused to justify policies enacting colonisation and genocide, such as the as Terra Nullius and the Stolen Generations policies. When we're talking about why IDS and IDG are so important, we're speaking about the rights. Now, Aboriginal people and communities have a right to IDS and IDG as underpinned by the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, more commonly known as the UNDRIP which has been endorsed by the Australian government in 2009. Now, what I wanted to do is step through a little bit of a breakdown of the UNDRIP because it normally is an instrument that people have a hard time, um, you know, working through or applying within any day and age, uh, sorry, within any process. So essentially when we're talking about the UNDRIP, it is broken up in the separations of different um, articles and articles one through to six speaks to nationality, self-determination, equality, freedom, Articles 7 through to 10 speak about life, integrity and security. Articles 11 through to 13 speak to the cultural, spiritual and language. Uh, articles 14 through to 17 um, speaks to education, information, uh, sorry, information and labour. Um, articles 18 through to 23 uh, speak to self-development of economic and social conditions. Articles 24 through to 31 speaks to land territory and territorial resources. Articles 32 through to, through to 36 speaks to the mean process to sustain self-determination. And Article 37 speaks to recognition, negotiation and treaties. Article 38 speaks to the development of state sanctioned legal support. Article 39 speaks to the technical and financial assistance. Um, articles 40 through 46 speaks to both state and international recognition of the UNDRIP and Article 46 speaks to the balance between existent laws and rights. But the main articles that I want to draw your attention to in, um, when we're speaking to the rights of uh, Indigenous people and IDS and IDG is Articles 1 through to 6, which really speaks to nationality, self-determination, equality and freedom, in particular Articles 3 and 4 of the UNDRIP.
So a bit about why IDS and IDG are important in regards to interpretation. Uh, so an example where uh, Western and Indigenous interpretations um, are the study of, is the study of the night sky. Um, so European astronomers had been studying the night sky for 3,500 years. Uh, Aboriginal astronomers had a huge start, however. So by the time the ancient Greeks were interested in the stars, Aboriginal astronomers had already studied the night sky for tens of thousands of years. So while Greek astronomers were distracted by the bright and shiny stars, Aboriginal astronomers focused on the dark patches between the glow of the Milky Way. So looking at that exact same sky and the exact same Milky Way in the exact same galaxy, Aboriginal people and the ancient Greeks observed and reported on different phenomena, um, which is why we say IDS and IDG and the interpretation, worldviews and knowledge systems um, that Indigenous people hold and the differences that that has in the Western, in Western views has such an impact on Aboriginal data and is so important for IDS and IDG. Ian, did you want to add a bit more on this slide about the interpretation? Yeah, I think it, the interpretation is so important, right, is because we have engaged in, I guess, a different way of approaching society understanding and also our understanding of the way that we work within this world. So at the same time, you know, we're speaking about dance, we're speaking about our culture, we're speaking about our song, we're speaking about our in interconnected song lines and trade routes that we utilise for tens of thousands of years prior to contact. So this is why interpretation is so important because we can be looking at the exact same thing but observing different phenomena, and that's why IDS and IDG is so important. When we're talking about IDS and IDG and the importance of IDS and IDG is because historically there has been an approach to data that has enacted the 5D narrative. Now non-Indigenous data governance has led to the 5D deficit narrative which has harmed Aboriginal people for generations. When we're talking about the five Ds, we're talking about difference, disparity, disadvantage, dysfunction, and deprivation, which has led to statistical Aborigine, as identified by Professor Maggie Walters. When we're talking about wiping out the five D narrative, we're talking about situations such as, you know, I'm going to step you through a little bit of examples here. So as you can see from the screen being presented, the ones that are crossed out are the deficit-based narratives. So for the first example, we might start out with a narrative that says Aboriginal children are better off with non-Aboriginal families. But if we change that and we flip the 5D narrative and actually apply a strength-based approach and incorporate in the views of our uh, world views of First Nation people and their resilience, the narrative can be completely different. So we might end up with something like Aboriginal children need to be raised with cultural permanency, well-being for Aboriginal children is correlated with cultural connection. Now, if we flip that and move to a different space, such as education, a 5D narrative for education might be that educational outcomes for Aboriginal students are significantly lower than their non-Aboriginal non counterparts. But we know, right, by uh, the policies of the path and by actually applying contextual relevant information, um, we could actually change that, right? And we could actually build a better narrative that actually supports First Nation people. And we might land on something that like that sounds like this, which is the Australian Australian past policies of excluding Aboriginal pe people from education has caused harm, which still impacts Aboriginal students today. I'm going to step you through another couple of examples that might be relevant in regards to different agency contexts. Um, a 5D narrative um, example might be Aboriginal people are more likely to offend and end up in prison than non-Aboriginal people. But we flip that and actually apply it in a contextual um, situation. The strength-based narrative it might land on is that the over-surveillance of Aboriginal people lead to a higher likelihood of involvement in the criminal justice system. Again, another 5D narrative in relation to risk factor could be that being Aboriginal is a risk within itself. But we flip that and actually look at the strength that First Nations and Aboriginal people hold, not only across New South Wales, but across Australia, we can land on something that's more strength based, right? And then we can land on something that's like this. Protective abilities and strengths are embedded in Aboriginal culture. Belonging to culture, uh, belonging to culture creates resilience, leading to better social and emotional and physical health outcomes.
Thanks, Ian. So leading on from what Ian had said and applying that in an agency and policy context is that we could be looking at data on spending, uh, data on spending on Aboriginal programs compared to general programs. Um, a 5D narrative and interpretation may lead to spending on Aboriginal programs is excessive compared to spending on generalist programs. But DCJ as an agency has the following responsibilities. So DCJ is obliged to reduce spending of public funds, and we're also obliged to appropriately support the people of New South Wales. However, this interpretation of that data then could lead to a policy of a reduction in spending on Aboriginal programs can reduce DCJ spending and provide further generalist service funding. However, the outcome is then that DCJ has reduced capacity to meet the needs of Aboriginal people arising from exposure to colonisation and genocide, negatively impacting on the health and wellbeing of Aboriginal people and increasing associated costs. However, if we flip this narrative, um, and look at the same data. So data on spending on Aboriginal programs compared to generalist programs, but using a different interpretation that, in whole, that upholds the principles of Indigenous data sovereignty and governance, and that's reporting in a strength-based and contextual manner, um, which leads to the interpretation that Australian governments must redress the harm caused to Aboriginal people by colonial and genocidal policies, including through investment into Aboriginal services. DCJ still has the same responsibilities, but it then leads to a policy that by funding Aboriginal services, DCJ redresses the harm we have caused to Aboriginal people and supports Aboriginal people's health and wellbeing. This then leads to an outcome that we meet the needs of Aboriginal people arising from exposure to colonisation and genocide. Um, so applying a, a different interpretation um, and removing that 5D narrative, we end up with a very different outcome that benefits Aboriginal people and communities. So when we're talking about the foundations of Indigenous data sovereignty and governance within DCJ, um, our project team at Naramunala has successfully advocated for the inclusion of Indigenous data sovereignty and governance in DCJ and New South Wales governance strategies, policies and initiatives. DCJ have commitments to facilitate an IDS and IDG principles under the following. DCJ's research strategy 2022 for 2025. Under this, we also have research priority reform for Aboriginal-led research, which supports Aboriginal-led research and the principles of Indigenous data sovereignty. We've also advocated for um, changes within the DCJ information management strategy from 2021 for to 2024. We've objected to being that we embed governance um, structures and Indigenous data sovereignty within the process of information management. And then we also have uh, the DCJ information management policy 2022. This policy is currently being revised in consultation with our Naramunala uh, Aboriginal-led um, data governance group to include the roles and responsibility of a new Aboriginal information asset owner and Aboriginal data custodian roles that will fall under uh, Deputy Secretary of Transforming Aboriginal Outcome, Brendan Thomas, and relevant Aboriginal directors across TAO and OSP. This will further embed and strengthen Indigenous data governance internally for ensuring that Aboriginal uh, there is Aboriginal governance of Aboriginal data. Uh, other foundations um, of IDS and IDG within DCJ are the New South Wales Data Strategy of 2021, which speaks to the strengthening transparency and trust, including engagement with Aboriginal community to implement IDS and IDG principles. We also have the National Agreement on Closing the Gap 2022, uh, sorry, 2020, um, and Priority Reform 4, which speaks to the shared access of data and information at a regional level. But through advocacy within the officer level working group, um, we have been, you know, myself, uh, my predecessor, as well as our CAPO partnerships have advocated fiercely within that space to ensure that we are going beyond just shared access and we're actually upholding the principles of Indigenous data sovereignty and governance. We also have foundations set out by the family's culture, which is um, the FIC response, which is recommendations one and two. In relation to the state and federal priorities of closing the gap, Australia has identified the closing the gap strategy as its key policy platform to give effect to the UNDRIP. Closing the gap priority reform four is again, shared access to data and information at a regional level the outcome of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander have access 
uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have access to and the capability to use locally relevant data and information to set and monitor the implementation of efforts to close the gap, their priorities and drive their own development. Under this priority, the Department of Aboriginal Affairs and Coalition of Aboriginal Peak Organisations are leading the development of an all of government IDS and IDG policy in collaboration with communities and clusters. So a little bit about the FIC report, which Ian had just mentioned, so the Families Culture Review. Uh, this report was released in November 2019 and is an independent review into Aboriginal children and young people in out-of-home care. The FIC investigated the reasons for the disproportionate and increasing number of Aboriginal children and young people in out-of-home care in New South Wales. The FIC made 125 recommendations about the way the New South Wales government delivers services and over 3,000 specific recommendations related to the 1,144 Aboriginal children and young people who entered out of home care in the 2015 to 16 year. So Naramana is responsible for leading the response to recommendations one and two, um, which are about Indigenous data sovereignty and governance. So the uh, that DCJ should convene a roundtable with the Aboriginal community and stakeholders to discuss the meaning of data sovereignty and the designing, collecting, interpreting of the department's administrative data relevant to Aboriginal children and young people. And then after the implementation of recommendation one, um, in partnership with Aboriginal uh, stakeholders and community developing a policy which results in that improved partnership being affected um, in the design collection and interpretation of data that's relevant to Aboriginal children and families. Uh, so some of the ways that we practically apply the principles of IDS and IDG, or we, um, as the Data Governance Group, advise various project teams to implement or apply the principles. Um, focusing on the principle of control, it's about sourcing Aboriginal governance and oversight of, pro of the project creation, development, the data interpretation, reporting and dissemination of the results. Um, the contextual principle, it's about ensuring that resulting data is able to be contextualised and disaggregated to local levels that are actually meaningful and relevant to Aboriginal communities. Uh, also publishing the resulting data that it's accessible to individuals and communities. Uh, the principle of relevance, it's about centering Aboriginal priorities and community data needs, um, ensuring relevance to Aboriginal families and communities rather than solely for DCJ purposes or interests. Uh, the accountability principle, so the, uh, ensuring consistent, transparent and contextualised reporting and dissemination of data irrespective of the results. Uh, creating an ongoing feedback loop with community to understand what the data mean for them and their data needs. And then the protective principles, so eliminating that 5D narrative, um, applying Aboriginal interpretation of the data um, and ensuring that data is reporting in, um, in context, acknowledging DCJ's historical and ongoing impact and the data quality issues as well. One example of how um, our project team have worked with uh, another team within the FACSIA structure to uh, apply and embed principles of Indigenous data sovereignty to, to ensure that we are responsive to community needs. Um, is that we actually embedded principles of IDS and IDG into new and existing DCJ program policies, strategies and projects. Uh, the Pathways of Longitudinal Care Study is an active case study for how the principles can be applied to DCJ research assets. POCLS is the first large scale perspective longitudinal study of children and young people in out of home care within Australia. Information on safety, permanency and wellbeing is collected through, from various sources. The child devel developmental domains of interest are physical health, social emotional wellbeing and cognitive learning abilities. POC was the first study to link da data on children's child protection background, out of home care placements, health, education and offer offending held uh, by multiple government agencies and match it to first hand accounts from children, caregivers, caseworkers and teachers. The POCLS database allows researchers to track children's experiences and outcomes from birth. And we are currently working in partnership with some of our CAPO membership to see how we can strengthen governance of the POCLS uh, moving forward into the future. Uh, 
uh, sorry, uh, the practical support Narramundla had delivered to, to Pockles. We provided guidance, guidance on appropriate reporting of comparative analysis and context when reporting results about Aboriginal people. We reviewed, uh, we've done reviews of the Pockles questionnaires and standardised measures of child development with a cultural lens to inform analysis and reporting for Wave 6. We provide advice on Pockles interactive dashboards in terms of data reported for Aboriginal cohorts and the gu guidelines regarding who has access to said da dashboards. Narramundal has also supported the Pockles through the following research initiatives, um, being that consultation with the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council to discuss how Pockles can update processes to understand what is considered current best practice and gather example of best practice in other research projects. We've also supported um, development and understanding and priorities of out of home care policy questions to inform POCL's analysis process, um, analysis process projects. We've also supported the facilitate, facilitating the collabor collaboration of contract analysts and policy and practice colleagues, including Aboriginal colleagues during the data analysis planning, analysis phase and interpretation of results and support a consultation with Aboriginal stakeholders about the most appropriate ways to develop culturally appropriate processes to draw insight from completed reports and translate findings into policy and practice. I'm going to speak a bit about the out of home care Aboriginal evidence base, which is Ian and I um, and Amy and the rest of our projects team um, main project. We've thus far really spoken about how we've been supporting um, the department and other project teams to uh, learn about the principles of Indigenous status sovereignty. Uh, but one of the ways we're applying is through the creation of an Aboriginal evidence base, which Nara Manala, um, our data governance group, are also overseeing. Um, so the AEB forms one of six projects under Faxia's Evidence Bank Implementation Program. This pilot phase of the AEB is focusing on out-of-home care data. And so applying the principles of IDS and IDG, the AEB will identify gaps in Aboriginal data from all EBIT program areas and formulate the metadata and data fields required to fill those gaps. Um, so we're addressing uh, the principles by uh, the principles of Indigenous data sovereignty by actually creating data that's contextual and disaggregating by creating uh, and disaggregated, sorry, by creating data that's relevant and empowers sustainable self-determination and effective self-governance, governance, by creating data structures that are accountable to Indigenous people and First Nations, and by reporting data that is protective and respectful of our individual and collective interests. Uh, so why are we starting with out of home care? Uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child placement principles were developed and enacted as New South Wales legislation in the 1970s. However, it's had limited inclusion in the creation of minimum data sets, um, which DCJ are required to collect and has never been accurately reported on. So the Permanency Support Cro Program minimum data set defines the collection of data required from NGOs in regards to Aboriginal children in out of home care. However, the Aboriginal led data questions are still listed as, as aspirational. And we know that an Aboriginal child's well-being is not well looked after when the child is placed in out-of-home care. Um, an Aboriginal child's connection to their family and their culture is paramount to ensuring that their well-being is supported. So this project aims to identify the data that needs to be collected to ensure the best practice is delivered for these children and to promote the validity, authenticity and transparency of a program's effectiveness for Aboriginal children. So I'll be speaking for a little bit of the process of um, how we're developing the Aboriginal evidence base. Um, essentially, the Aboriginal evidence base is um, a metadata asset that we're going to be developing um, that actually looks at data in a holistic view. So rather than just focus on, let's say, for an example, like the number of kids that are at risk of significant harm and have been removed, we're actually creating the full, trying to create the full picture around it by utilising um, different out-of-home care um, reports that have been accepted by New South Wales government. So in step one of our process, it was all about data analysis. Our EBIT team are currently identifying existing data and the data that's required to meet the national reporting requirements, such as the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Child Placement Principles, Closing the Gap and Snake Family Matter Report. We're also looking at community data requests, such as, you know, FIC recommendations, Aboriginal 
back one, sorry, May. Um, Aboriginal researchers and Aboriginal led community data requests, such as the Maranooka, Just Reinvest, and other community um, uh, IDS and IDG groups that are, um, as well as Aboriginal researchers who are requesting data of us to inform pros processes, our uh, projects. Step two of the process was, is all about a gap analysis and subject matter expert, um, expert consultation. So EBIP uh, within this stage engaged COA, which is an Aboriginal led consultancy firm that focuses on the impact that data has on First Nations communities within New South Wales, but also works across Australia. Through this, um, through this engagement, we asked uh, COA to conduct an analysis of 13 out of home care specific reports accepted by the New South Wales government to identify the data DCJ should be collecting to respond to community data needs that align to IDS and IDG principles, but also uh, meets the New South Wales Treasury outcome budgeting requirements. The metadata asset will be created to capture the output. The AEB team are consulting with our Naramala um, governance group and internal Aboriginal out of home care SMEs to identify, refine and agree on, metadata asset, on the metadata asset and data elements that should be considered for collection as a part of the PSP minimum data set. Once we've completed step two, we will then move into the phase of actually community engagement. This, this step is the most crucial step of the whole thing because we're actually going out to have a, establish and have an ongoing dialogue with community to reality check and complete the findings prior to the recommendation being made to the DCJ executives for considerations. So to finish up, what can we as Naramanala share? Um, and that's creating a culturally safe space. So creating a space for the agencies, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff to come together with your data and research staff to create a partnership model to design the agency's model for engaging with IDS and IDT. Uh, to centre Aboriginal voices. So start your processes by introducing introducing external Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander subject matter experts in Indigenous data sovereignty and governance to deliver the knowledge as required to start looking at how you as a government agency or organisation uh, should be engaged in IDS and IDG, uh, to stay closely engaged with the Aboriginal-led community initiatives to ensure the internal advocacy remains tightly aligned with the community's agenda, uh, to main average to maintain Aboriginal staff and external experts in the integral positions of developing, designing, implementing and evaluating the IDS and IDG program formed uh, and to start small. So create small timeline phases for your project deliverables within your program logic um, to ensure that the scope of work is achievable and the appropriate expertise can be drawn on effectively both internally and externally. Just might add on to this slide here, Melona, is that the way that we see it as a project team that there are two elements of IDS and IDG um, that we need to consider when we're looking at it holistically. And it's the fact that we have the community side where we have to allow the space for community to grow their knowledge and to develop their own community infrastructure to be able to request, hold, and to be able to um, analyze, to engage in research, to do all the elements that uphold self-determination within the context of Indigenous data sovereignty. But while that is going on, we also have to create the mechanisms internally of government to be able to support that. So essentially, we're utilising the expertise of Aboriginal staff internally to think about and be proactive about what the infrastructure may be needed to respond to the community data requests. Because as we know, as Aboriginal people, we do not hang our community hats on the door when we walk into our, our, age, our, our respective agencies when we're ever we're engaging with work. We're community all the time. So essentially, we've got to work at, as a as a whole, two parts of us, uh, two cogs within the machine of IDS and IDG that works together to support the clients that we serve across New South Wales. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, I think that's really important. That's why I think we also have um, engaging in IDS and IDG and really being led by community um, and so that we're, while we're doing the work to prepare our agencies or organisations internally to be able to enable and respond to community, um, we're not doing IDS and IDG. It's about really preparing to respond and enable that. Um, the last tip we can share is really learning from community. 
um, being led by community. So some of the organisations that we've went, learned a lot from and really been led um, by is the Mayan Nari Wingara Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Data Sovereignty Collective, which was formed in early 2017 um, to develop those Indigenous data sovereignty and principles that were relevant for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in an Australian context. Uh, Kawa, who we've also mentioned, uh, they're a team of change makers with a shared vision to amplify the voice of First Nations people in impact measurement, evaluation and learning. The Maya Kauai study, um, which looks at how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander wellbeing is linked to things like connection to country, cultural practices, spirituality and language use. Uh, the Nyang Waiyama Central Coast Aboriginal Data Network, um, which bring together Aboriginal people on the Central Coast to discuss matters relating to data access, data capacity building and data sovereignty. The Maranooka Community Hub, which is a grassroots tool for um, people to shape and determine their future uh, for Aboriginal people in that community. Sorry, it's, so it's a vehicle to empowerment, uh, self-determination, co-design and flexible service delivery. Um, and the Darawai Elders Partnership with UNSW um, to improve wellbeing, social, built and physical environment and life pathways of Aboriginal people in Walgett. I guess so to wrap it up, I just wanted to finish up on um, leaving our contacts up here. So we are at, we have an open door policy. Any questions, um, you know, any issues that you may be facing uh, in regards to facilitating and upholding the principles of Indigenous data sovereignty within, that, within your agency context or within your organisation, we're more than happy to help. So as you can see from the screen, we also, we have um, myself, my email up there, May Lawners, and our manager, Amy Opios. We also have our Naramana Secretariat email address for you to reach out and contact us. Um, on that note, thank you for listening to our presentation and how we're engaging in the work of IDS and IDG. And as you can see, myself and May Lawner are very passionate about it. So thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Mayne, for a wonderful presentation. I think you can see from the applause that's coming from the crowd how well appreciated uh, your presentation was. I mean, really thoroughly. I mean, you grounded us in the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Rights. You took us through that kind of flipping the 5D narrative and gave us some really practical examples about how to apply what is a pretty complicated kind of set of thoughts to really complicated um, government data sets. We do have a little bit of time for anybody who might want to ask any questions. I'm going to ask you one in the first instance. You, you talked about really, really eloquently about flipping that 5D narrative. A lot of people on the line, I, I'm assuming, are dealing with data in their day-to-day day -day work. Any thoughts or advice for how people might be able to do that kind of on a daily basis in terms of flipping that narrative in the work that they're doing? For me, it's definitely coming back to, you know, um, the, I guess the reason why we named our project team what we did, because it's literally all about, let's see, hear, listen from the experts, which are First Nation people and those those who are engage, engaging within our service systems. Um, you know, there's, for those who have been to First Nations rallies, there's a chant that they always say, and it's nothing about us without us. And it's about utilising the internal experts that you have, uh, which are First Nations people that exist within the respective agencies. And it's about upholding and valuing their lived experiences, their knowledge, uh, their knowledge, because we don't learn this in any institution, we live it, we breathe it, and it's all about sovereignty. It's all about rights. So I guess um, to cut it short, it would be just listen open your ears, open your hearts, and be open to the critique and to the challenges that may come up. Thanks, Ian. I can see a few people with their hands up. We actually can't share the microphone. So if you've got a question, can you type it in the chat and then we'll be able to ask it out to, to Ian and May. I mean, you've been through the process of setting up Naramanala. Um, thinking many of the people who are listening to us this afternoon might be thinking about how to do a similar thing. Um, in the agencies they're working on. Any advice on how to get started structurally about going around a process like this? I think we spoke to it, Brendan, in regards to partnering, like utilising the internal Aboriginal units that you have um, and partnering with respective uh, research, analysis and insight units that may exist within agencies. And that's where the journey starts, like really that open relationship 
um, to learn from one another and to value lived experience but of First Nation people as well as our non-Indigenous counterparts who work within this space and have studied, um, you know, Western systems of, of insight analysis and data. Um, May, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Um, just that I think something that's worked really well with Naramanala is that we haven't come from a formal uh, structure or because we're in this position, we're a part of this group. We've really formed as a group of people that were interested and passionate about this work to come together um, and learn about Indigenous data sovereignty. So it's really about the people and their passion about this area um, rather than the positions that our members are in. And I also just to add on the back end of that, I think it's the openness of the hierarchy that exists within the agency to almost be humbled, you know, in the processes. So we are very fortunate within the Naramanala group that we are not seen as, you know, I guess within that hierarchical structure. Yes, we do have our executive director that joins the Naramanala uh, membership as well as directors across Faxia. But when we're in that forum, we are all equals. We all uh, have what we have to say is valid no matter what our positions are in the hierarchical structure of the agency. And I think that's a, a very important um, point to make as well and the passion that individual people share. Thanks, guys. There's a question from Anna around how much of this is connected to kind of surveys and data collection. So how much of what you're doing, I suppose, is shaping the way that data might be collected um, within DCJ and how, I, I suppose, what might be some of the challenges that you've, you've experienced in shaping the way data is being collected? Uh, I think one of our biggest challenges have been balancing um, the rights of Indigenous people to Indigenous data sovereignty and governance versus Western systems or legislation such as the privacy and confidentiality, is that we're, we're tussling with, you know, two systems and we're trying to find a middle ground because a right is a right, but, you know, there is legislation to say that it's protective. But at the end of the day, uh, we're always going to have issues around identification and confidentiality just purely due to the number of Aboriginal people that exist not only across New South Wales, but across Australia. Um, so it's about how do we think creatively and openly about applying, um, I guess, approaches to research and data analysis that considers the rights of Indigenous people. So it could be creative. And I think I might hand over to um, my colleague, Maylona, because she is our expert in terms of community data requests. Uh, sorry, I think um, that's what we're really trying to achieve as well through the Aboriginal evidence base and also doing this exercise and through our um, engagement with community and through their requests, um, we've come to learn that we don't collect um, a lot of data currently that is really useful or relevant um, uh, to Aboriginal people and communities or really about their priorities. Um, and that's what the aim of the AEB um, is really to um, try and make sure that we're at least um, establishing the structures to hopefully be able to collect the right data in the future to be able to have the data that community um, need. Um, yeah. Right. Thanks, guys. There's a question from Karen. Um, will this more broadly be applied to other program areas like homelessness, youth justice, the criminal justice system, and narrow-minimalized based in FACSIA in the former FAX part of, of DCJ. How are we going in terms of applying the same approach as, say, in the criminal justice uh, world? I think that's a really um, a great question because at the end of the day, we have to work collaboratively as an agency, right? And um, we also have to, you know, rely and partner with our respective um, peak organisations, such as, you know, the Aboriginal Legal Service and ABSEC within this space because they do, you know, have their own area of expertise, but also really listening to those that are receiving our services. Um, our system, in all honesty, if I'm being point blank, we've had reports after reports on how we can amend and, and fix our system to better meet the needs of Aboriginal people, but we just haven't enacted it, you know, and it, and it plays out across all levels of government. 
Um, so, yeah, partnering, being open to the learning, um, being ready to have difficult conversations, um, but also knowing that it's not coming from a place of malice. It's coming from a place of trying to pl practically uphold and implement, you know, uh, principles to support the community needs. Um, so we're working in partnership um, and speaking to our counterparts across DCJ. Um, and as I alluded to, um, spoke to earlier, you know, some some conversations around um, the appropriate governance that we apply open is very open in the way that we actually engage with our capo, capo, mem um, capo organisations as well. So yeah, we are learning. We're we're slow but surely getting across there, and that's why we why we said you got to start small because this is a beast, um, and we got to make sure that we're doing it right in the first instant before we just roll it out across all of the agency. Thanks, Ian. There's a question from Jordan. He says, could you take us researchers through a process or the role of Naramanla in research partnerships with DCJ? Is there a role for Naramanla in working? With research partnerships across DCJ, what might that be, Ian or Matt? Might defer this question to May. Thanks. So we actually work with a research team um, that engages with external researchers um, quite closely. We have um, the manager on our Naramanala membership um, who supports us with her research and analytical expertise. Um, we've already early on um, in the program, we were able to successfully um, apply or include the principles of Indigenous data sovereignty into the external research um, request form um, when you're applying to seek support from DCJ. So we're um, in that you're now having to provide evidence of your Aboriginal oversight um, and how we're actually including Aboriginal people in all parts of the research as well. Um, as mentioned in the presentation earlier, we've also advocated for the inclusion of the fourth research priority in our research strategy, which is to support Aboriginal-led uh, research and the principles of Indigenous data sovereignty. Um, as for future projects, some of the uh, proposals will come to Naramanala for advice if it's um, has a heavy focus or uses Aboriginal data. Um, uh, the ways we haven't directly engaged um, with the external research partners, but I'm sure um, with Indigenous status sovereignty and governance um, uplifting in its profile that we may have a greater role as we move into the future. I think it's also important too for external resources to leverage the expertise that is that are out there within community as well. You know, so we did speak to the HMRC, um, and they are made up of Aboriginal academics, you know, and expertise within that space. So don't be afraid to have the conversation and be open to adjusting your research um, to what our Aboriginal experts have to say in that regard. Um, so it's very much just being open to that change and really dropping i guess it can be seen as a notion that you know can be prioritizing western structures to engage in with research just being open to changing that and being and, and being responsive to first nations people thanks guys there's a question from jenny really important question about reporting back to the community on outcomes what's the plan or the process for reporting back to community on what's working and what's not In relation to IDS and how we're tangibly applying it, um, I think the process is just that, like I said, it's about the yarn. Um, my pre our predecessor, my former manager, Winston Matthews, had this famous saying, don't be afraid of the power of the yarn. Um, you know, being there and just being open to having that conversation. I know I keep talking about this open dialogue, but that's what it's about because for, dec uh, for decades and really since uh, first contact. First Nation people haven't really been heard in our country on our traditional homelands. Um, and that has, you know, caused the outcomes uh, or, you know, I guess we could say the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people across our service delivery um, is the fact that we haven't been listening as government. And I say we because I'm a part of the government structure. So that's why we're internally advocating for being open and having that conversation. It is so powerful, the power of the yarn. And uh, me personally, I love the yarn. Um, I would much rather have a conversation um, than read a briefing note back the front. I could read a briefing note back the front 
10 times, but I wouldn't get as much out of that briefing note as I would as talking to the person who's actually formulating that, that briefing note and actually understanding where they're coming from. So that's why I say it's so important that we have, a, have that conversation in the yarn. We've still got a bunch of questions coming through. I think we might have time for one more, which is a great question from Louise. Do you have practical tips for NGOs to improve this work? For example, the things to consider when we design our data systems or how we report on data. So any tips for our colleagues in the non-government sector starting to think about these issues? Well, if we're talking about um, the non-government sector in terms of just service providers, then again, it's engaging with your local community. There are mechanisms that exist um, across community, whether it's through, you know, um, the local decision decision making accords through the Department of Aboriginal Affairs, or it's mechanisms that are developed from your respected agencies within communities that leverage the expertise of local community members. Again, I keep referring back to this power of the yarn, but it is so crucial in understanding the needs of communities because at the end of the day, I'm not an expert in Indigenous data sovereignty. You know, our team are an expert within it. The only people that are experts within Indigenous data sovereignty are the community themselves. Um, and in regards to our, our, uh, our Aboriginal community controlled organisations, they know that they already co collect robust and great data that fills the whole circle around the profile of a client. But yet us as government aren't asking for that. So it's learning from your counterparts within the space that are Aboriginal community control, learning from your community, and then bringing that back in and thinking openly, inviting First Nation people into the conversation. Thanks so much for that, Ian. And thanks so much, Ian and May, for such a wonderful and thoughtful presentation this afternoon. It's such important work for all of us to be thinking about. You guys are really leading the way inside government for thinking about how to do uh, this work and pushing us in DCJ to really think differently about how we use our data and how we go about engaging community for doing that. So thank you. I think there's a lot of things people can take away from um, your presentation, especially your tips that you've given, but flipping that 5D narrative. There's one thing everybody on the call today can do is flip that narrative and think of the, the examples May gave us, such practical, easy ways in which you can do that and make such a difference in the way we see um, data and the way we use data. So thank you so much for that. Thanks everyone for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Thank you for everybody who's who's asked questions and hopefully you'll take some pretty serious thoughts away from, from the presentation today that you'll be able to apply to your work. So for everyone that's registered for the event in the next week or so, you'll receive an email with a link to where you'll be able to view the recording of this webinar. And there'll be some additional links and materials relating to the webinar that will be listed on the Lunch and Learn uh, website. Also ask you to join us for the next Faxia Lunch and Learn uh, webinar, which is supporting children and young people with disabilities in out of home care. And we'll post a link to that webinar in the chat. But for now, thanks again for taking the time to join us, to join us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Hello everyone.